Hi, I'm Frank Vogler with V&V Land Management. Welcome to our road building tutorial video. In this video, we're going to go through the eight essential steps of road construction. The idea is that you will learn all these basic eight components such that when you're going to build your road or comparing bids from differing contractors, you'll have a basis for comparison and that you won't make a tragic mistake that will cost you lots of money. We feel like this road build video is kind of filling the information gap. There's not a whole lot online for folks to educate themselves regarding roads. So the idea is to give you, the client, um, the basics on road building. We're going to kind of kind of make the analogy of baking a cake and try to keep it simple here. This road, road build video could turn out to be quite long. We'll try to go through each of these steps in a way that, that arms you with some knowledge so when you're comparing bids with different contractors, you know you're really getting apples and apples bids. You know you're getting a whole, a whole cake and that it's going to be a good one. The first step in any road construction project is planning and layout. This is where you decide where your road's going to go, how long it is, how it ties into your future home site, how it ties into the public road, your width, your corridor, everything is done in the planning stage. Super important, imperative. You've got to spend time on your planning stage. Step number two, corridor clearing. We've got all our ingredients on the table. We're actually going to start to make our cake now. And this is when you remove the biomass from the road build area. Not just the road bed, but also the cut slope and the fill slope. Um, we use a variety of different techniques, forestry mulching. Um, sometimes those areas are simply just timbered off. Um, in any event, it's where you, you create your footprint for the road, but you haven't begun grading it yet. Number three. Number three is erosion control. Now this goes hand in hand with corridor clearing. Anytime you have a major soil disturbance, that more than an acre in most municipalities, um, you're gonna have to deal with the possibility of erosion. It's the law, it's also good practice. So erosion control is nothing more than retaining all of the soils on site. And you've got to, of course, be thinking about how these things are lost. And it's hydrology, it's rain and water, the effects of water that cause erosion control to be so important. Number four, rough grading. Rough grading is where about 75% of our road build takes place. This is where the muscle happens. This is where we take the land and we shape the road from the land. Number five, drainage installation. This is the part of the job where you install all those features that are gonna help you evacuate water from the site. Um, we'll talk more about that as well. This is a crucial part of your job. Number six, finish grading and compaction. This is where everything comes together and that we finally smooth out our driving surface. We really try to make the whole project come together in a nice, tight, aesthetically pleasing way. Number seven, surfacing. This is what you're going to drive on, simply put. There are lots of choices here and you want to make sure that you're not spending money unnecessarily on something that's not needed or not getting as much material as was promised. So we'll talk in some detail about surfacing. And then finally, revegetation. This is where you protect your investment. This is where this whole area that's been cleared and devegetated is revegetated. Um, absolutely critical. I often see roads that were built correctly and then not revegetated and of course they wash away because it's unnatural in Mother Nature to have areas of bare soil. So um, we'll go through each of these eight sections as best we can. Probably can't give you all the information you might like in the course of a short video, but nonetheless we'll try to touch on what's absolutely necessary. Okay, let's spend some time on planning and layout. This is typically where road building projects really go wrong. Um, it's absolutely essential. I could do probably half this video on planning and layout alone and um, we'd, we'd be somewhere. If a road is constructed poorly but it's constructed in the correct place, probably it can be fixed at minimal cost. If it's laid out incorrectly, who knows what it's going to cost to fix. We see it all the time in the mountains. So let me just start by saying it again. Any money you spend on planning and layout and thoroughness with regard to these two things is money back in your pocket. It's going to ensure that your road building project goes well, that you have a safe 
and durable and equity building road on your property. We use lots of digital mapping techniques, bringing publicly available information together and creating a good composite of our client's entire property so we can really lay the road out correctly. Soils maps, topographical maps, old tax maps, photographs, whatever we can find to create a really good and accurate composite of our client's property. Sometimes we need engineers and surveyors, but we try whenever we can to keep the cost down and get what we need. The beauty of digital mapping techniques is it allows us to have the map laid out on paper in three-dimensional fashion so you can really see the contours of the land. It also allows us to lay the map, lay the road out on the ground. You can walk through, everybody can walk the road. With regard to the cake analogy, it's where you put all your ingredients on the table and see if you've got enough to, to bake the cake. With regard to the subject of grade, this is a major issue in the mountains. A road that's longer may often be a much, much better value, although it's initially more expensive to build. 14% um, is what we consider to be the maximum suitable grade for a gravel driveway. Beyond that, you need to think about paving. Beyond 20%, probably you don't need to build it. In any event, if a road rises 14 feet in 100, that's a 14% grade. That or less is an acceptable and durable grade and a safe grade in the mountains to be building a road on. It's important not just to know the grade, but it's important to know where your road enters the public road. Is it going to tie in in an area where you have good visibility? Is it going to tie into your home site correctly? One additional component of a road build like this is when you map your road correctly, you can map in outrageous views like this. This was not a view that was available before this road was, con was constructed. So you can see one of the, the added benefits of just taking the time to do it right. And we knew we'd have this viewscape because we took the time to map this road in. And while a road is largely a, a series of technical considerations, you always want to be looking out for opportunities like increased aesthetic enhancement like this viewscape. Another important aesthetic consideration, as well as a financial consideration that should be explored during the planning phase is retention. Many, if not most, mountain driveways and home sites are going to require some sort of retention structure. We personally believe traditional dry laid masonry is, for the most part, the best and most attractive solution and value. We guarantee these walls forever. When they're correctly built, dry laid walls provide the best drainage as well as the best retention. They fit in with the character of the mountains and also provide incredible opportunities for landscaping. All these variables should be ironed out before you ever cut your road. There's still going to be some variables at play, water and rock potentially, but iron out all the basic variables by taking your time to do good planning and do good layout. Any contractor who won't spend time doing this with you, don't hire him. Step number two, corridor clearing. Corridor clearing is basically where we've got all of our ingredients, we've done our planning, and now we're actually going to begin the project. We're going to start to, to bake the cake. Okay, the first thing we need to do is get rid of all the biomass that's in the way. Now with corridor clearing, let me just say one simple thing. We don't want to take too much, but we don't want to take too little. People are often shocked when they see the road corridor going in and see all the vegetation removed and they think, well, I only have a 15 or 16 or 18 foot wide road, why do I need 30 feet cleared out? And um, the answer is simple, the heavy equipment, we need to, to, rough grading practices involve a variety of different land shaping activities and we need the room to create the bed within that corridor. Um, utilities may often be going up that road or down the grade in some fashion. Um, and one of the issues this creates is that people want to be able to save trees which aren't going to be viable in the road corridor area. Um, the good news is that the smaller trees that are left on the edges and even the bigger trees are going to kind of canopy over and fill the empty space um, as they're wont to do since their, their brethren have been removed. But we feel like that it's not a good practice to leave too many trees in a road corridor area. They usually don't make it in spite of our best efforts and it's not because we've, we've struck the equipment or damaged it with our, our blades and, and shovels. It's simply that uh, the root systems have been too badly damaged to continue to survive. There's also a good chance you're going to need dirt on either side of the road to fill up dips in the road, to build turns, and so give yourself the opportunity to get that dirt. Avoid, rather, having to come back and remove vegetation, principally trees, in order to get that dirt. Also, clear out trees such that you don't have roots and all that sort of stuff sticking out in your cut and fill slopes. This is where you need all of the biomass, all the topsoils, 
everything out of the way. You need, you need to be able to access good, compatible virgin soils underneath. Um, a quick word about topsoils. Don't just push them off the mountain. Take the time to sequester your topsoils. It's the earth's skin. It's extremely valuable material. You're going to want to reuse it for revegetation later or even in your garden. Don't just discard it. It took thousands of years to create it. We often find the best way to do that is by using uh, forestry mulching equipment, by mulching entire areas to put a large, a large blanket of mulch down. This protects the soil. We can move it out of the way when we need to. This is a relatively new technology, but it allows us to mulch biomass all through the corridor and open it up and also retain that mulch on site, which is a good erosion control technique. Another um, time-honored logger technique is to use the tops of trees to uh, braid them up with a track hoe and use them on the fill slope below the road. This prevents erosion and assists the silt fencing and, and keeping all materials on site. Step number three is erosion control. Erosion control in truth goes hand in hand with corridor clearing, but typically we have to do a little bit of clearing before we can even get our erosion control measures in place. Um, every, every county in the United States requires erosion control. Uh, if your contractor hasn't accounted for this in your bid, you need to make sure he does. That's not okay. Uh, erosion control is simply the act of retaining all of your soils on site. Silt fences are a primary means of controlling erosion. Uh, brush berms, which I mentioned a moment ago in the corridor clearing phase where a track hoe braids up all the treetops below the, the toe slope of the road. Forestry mulching again is another a great erosion control measure which provides mulch. In many cases your um, local municipality is going to require certain erosion control techniques, retention ponds, and often these are in conjunction with the various permitting required to build the road. It is your responsibility to make sure that none of the waterways in your area have any turbidity or color as the result of your excavation. And it's your responsibility to keep these soils off of neighboring properties. It is the law. You've got to have good erosion control protocols. It also protects your investment. When you're building a road, you're required by law to keep all sediment on site. You have to stop erosion. And sometimes just the very simplest things make the biggest difference. There are about, um, I think there's about 42 check dams on this site. They take very, very little time to build. They're simply riprap placed in kind of a, they call them check dams, they're kind of like a check, more like a smile configuration. Uh, they're low in the middle and they catch silt that comes off the site. And no matter how good you are, you're always going to lose some dirt. So you want to you do whatever you can to keep it in place. This is one effective way to do it. You come in here, you take a shovel, you clean it out, hydro seeding fills right in, and you can remove these or leave them depending on what you want to do or what your client wants to do, but it's a super effective way to stop erosion. All erosion control requires maintenance. It's not something you do one time on a site. You've got to be aware of what's going on on your site. You've got to maintain the stability and the efficacy of your erosion control, um, which means cleaning out check dams, cleaning out silt fencing, cleaning out retention ponds, and monitoring the weather. Monitoring the weather is part of your erosion control protocol. It means when a storm is coming in, you can move brush into various places. You can cut berms and unfinished road grade areas to catch water or move water. Anyway, erosion control has to be a substantial part of your road planning as well as, your, as the protection of your investment during its construction. Step number four, rough grading. This is where about 75% of our work's gonna be done. This is where the road takes shape from the land. This is where all the ingredients of the cake are being mixed up and poured into the pan and we're gonna to start to get the shape of the cake. We've got everything ready to go and we still have the original shape of the land. We're gonna move large quantities of dirt from one spot to another. It's where we're gonna build turns. It's where we're gonna have cut slopes and fill slopes. This is where the muscle happens. You can see behind me an area where we've got a cut bank. You can see the original grade here. And you can see we're dropping the grade down to get a more gentle rise from a hill below us, which you'll see in a moment. Um, but the idea here is to make the road as smooth and drivable as possible. Everything happens here. If, a, if something's wrong, finished grading can't cover it up. So we want to take our time, move all the dirt that we need to, to move, um, keep a careful eye on what kind of soils we're moving into also and what kind of rock we're getting into. We don't want to see a whole lot of biomass out here. You can see we're into virgin subsoil at this point. 
and um, the whole road needs to be constructed on on subsoil materials, on good compacted subsoil materials and no biomass in here. The most important factor in rough grading is the skill and the equipment of your contractor. In the mountains where we work, you've got to have guys who've worked and have lots of experience in the mountains. Um, you need to have equipment that's scaled to the job. If your contractor shows up with a mini excavator and a skid steer to build your 1,000 foot road, they're not working to scale. Just to give you a sense of what we use to build a mountain driveway, usually at least a 160 if not a 200 size track hoe, usually a 650 to a 700 size bulldozer. You need to get it done quickly because it lessens your exposure to the weather. Dump trucks are often required. Rough grading requires a lot of experience and common sense. In the mountains, it's not uncommon to have to move large quantities of dirt from one site to another. It may be much, much more efficacious, for instance, to transport that via a dump truck and track hoe to that area than have a dozer push it. You've just got to have an experience grader. Um, you've got to have a feel for this. What I would recommend is talking to your grader about the rough grading process and also, of course, looking at their previous jobs, but this is where it, um, it all takes shape. A really important component of rough grading um, and also a, an important component that's going to affect the durability and drivability of the road later on are your cut and fill slopes. We try to tie our cut slopes, these are the upper slopes on the road, the roads that, the parts that go down into the drainage ditch. We try to tie these into the natural grade of the land. You can see that we've tied the grading into the hillside. One of the things that I think is important for long-term road construction is whenever possible, tie your grades into the natural grade. Now right here we couldn't do it, um, we needed to take dirt to create this area. We're still at close to a two to one grade, which is appropriate. But whenever you can, tie your slopes into the natural grade. It creates a better finished look and it creates greater road durability, hugely important. But what you don't want to see is a road cut in where the side angle of the bank is that steep. That, bangle, that angle, that, that dirt's going to fall into the road and occlude your drainage ditches and really create a long term um, durability problem for the road. The other thing is when these banks are cut they should slope directly into that ditch. If they're bellied out on the bottom and they fall down into the ditch that additional dirt, um, what I'm calling a belly, that little mound of dirt at the bottom will again fall in your ditch and force the water out into the road. Rough grading should also account for a crown on the road. Even highways have crowns. Um, the crown is the way you disperse water. A crown should send most of the water into the drainage ditch below, or to the inside of the road rather, and some of the water off onto the fill slope on the other side. Um, finally, rough grading should also account for a camber. So you have, a, you have a crown, and then you have a camber. A camber is what makes you feel safe on a road. It holds the inside, holds you towards the inside of the road. If you have an icy driving surface, you want your road to be cambered such that if you slid, you slid towards the inside drainage ditch. One thing I think is really important, especially in the mountains where we work with regard to rough grading is this. On turns, kind of the old, old redneck way of doing this is just pushing the dirt off the mountain at a turn until the turn's wide enough to turn in it. This is not the way you build a turn correctly. The way you build a turn or a switchback correctly is to go down below the turn and cut a key, much like you would for a dam. Cut a bench, a flat area and push the dirt down into this flat area and build it up in compacted lifts. There should be no biomass, no stumps, no vegetation, no topsoil, nothing in that area. So essentially you're trying to create kind of a dam. It's going to require more dirt this way. It's going to take more time this way. It is the only correct way to do it. Don't do it the other way. Ask your contractor how he's going to build your turns. You can see behind me, I parked my old truck back here. Uh, for the purpose of showing you that another car can pass on the inside. We've got enough room and this is a turnout lane. We've got about a hundred and eighty yards this way and about a hundred and fifty yards this way and so we thought it practical to, to create a turnout lane where folks could pass each other without having to back up the whole way. This should be a consideration in your road build if you are building in the mountains and you have a, a large area that you're benching your grade in. You should think about a turnout lane as a matter of safety and convenience for everybody. So rough grading, as I said, is where the road begins to take shape. It's kind of um, the most basic part of road construction and everything after that point is refinement.
Okay, number five, drainage installation. These are features that allow you to evacuate water from the road. The principal components of drainage installation are drainage tiles, culverts. You see them everywhere. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times they're installed incorrectly or there simply aren't enough of them. We generally use 15 inch drainage culverts in the mountains, primarily because we don't want to use larger ones, which would indicate that we uh, have too large, volume, too large a volume of water at any one spot on the road. Drainage culverts need to have inflow and outflow protection. This is where you're funneling the water on the inflow side and you're catching it and slowing it down on the outflow side. And in both cases, what they need is foundation fabric to keep the soil at either end of the pipe from scouring and hand placed, I said hand placed riprap to collect that water, to hold it in place, to keep silt from running through the pipe and to get the water off the road in sufficient quantity. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with drainage installations. One, they use drainage tiles which are too short. They come in 20 foot lengths, which does not mean you need to use 20 feet every time. And most of ours end up being a little bit longer and we end up adding pieces on. We often see a contractor trying to save a little bit of money and the road suddenly narrows where a drainage tile is because he's trying to get away with a 20 foot drainage tile. Um, let me also say something about making them too long where they hang over the fill slope and then end up creating a waterfall below and scouring out. Make them the right length. They should have about one foot of drop every 20 feet. That's enough to get the water off the road. We sometimes see them where the water is actually going back into the inflow. That's a problem. Another aspect of this is on the upper side of switchbacks. The water coming down, when you turn, your inside ditch is actually going to cross the road right there. So you're going to send the water on the high side off the road. If you imagine your elbow, you're going to send it off down this way. You've got to have some kind of an apron there so the water is, the velocity and the volume of water is slowed down. Um, the placement and location of these drainage culverts is very important in the mountains as well. You don't want to stair step, you don't want to stack water and so you may want to stagger your culverts but you've got to account for all this water that you're concentrating on the road with regard to your drainage tiles. It should be laid out in advance in your planning stage. You should have a very clear idea of how many culverts you should need and where they're going to go before you start your road. Step number six, finish grading and compaction. I've lumped these together because usually for us they happen simultaneously. Finish grading is where we're coming through and we're really dressing up the road. We're putting the icing on the cake and we're trying to do it in such a, a manner that is extremely appealing as well as effective. We may take our track hoe bucket down our drainage ditch and smooth it out so it's not occluded in any way. We may take the time to, to walk our banks, our cut and fill banks with a dozer to make sure we have a good even grade. This also makes it more susceptible to hydro seeding and revegetation. Um, compaction, with regard to that too, we're kind of trying to make sure that our roadbed doesn't just look good, isn't just smooth and ready to accept surfacing. We're going to make sure that it, um, it's fully compacted. And there are a few areas that might keep this from, from being the case. Areas where we've had to put drainage tiles in, those have been dug up. Those will require a little extra attention to compact those so there won't be lumps or, or speed dips right there, which you don't want. And in fill areas, especially at turns and switchbacks, large quantities of dirt have been moved and been stacked up in lifts on those areas. Those areas usually require compaction. Uh, for compaction, we usually use a sheep's foot or a compaction roller. And this allows us to, to put real, real pressure on this roadbed and compact all these variable soils and, and, and variable surfaces and get an even good finished driving surface that's ready to be, be dressed out. All right, step number seven, surfacing. Surfacing is where we put the icing on the cake. It's where um, we finish everything out. It's your driving surface. And so, number one rule, we want to have enough of it. What we have used here is ABCM, or Crusher Run Stone. Um, this is mixed aggregate stone and what we find is when we have a, a really well compacted road as this one is, this is the best surfacing for it. Here in the southeast we typically have roads with a clay base. Um, this is an appropriate surfacing material. The aggregate in here, there's a large size two inch piece of gravel and then we've got material all the way down to 
to fines and then dust. And um, as we work this in with a tractor blade and, and uh, grade everything back in, we find that this settles into a well-compacted road that mimics the effect of a paved road, but with a little bit more grip and certainly a lot lower price tag. Sometimes um, various spots of the road will require railroad ballast, fill areas like turns or entry points require railroad ballast often. Uh, railroad ballast is a larger material and is, is considered a foundational layer for a road. In any event, you want to make sure that you're getting an adequate amount of gravel for your road. The first time you put the gravel down, put it down heavy. The road's going to settle, it's going to change over time. Subsequent layers won't have to be nearly as thick. So spend the money up front and get your gravel surfacing down right. Um, feel free also to ask your contractor to supply you with the the quarry ticket so you'll know you're getting the full number of loads, the full tonnage that you're paying for. Also, make sure that your surfacing comes in contact with the areas that are going to be revegetated. It's not okay to leave two feet of red bare dirt between the revegetation area and the surfacing. It should be spread out evenly all the way down such that these areas are contiguous. and we are to revegetation. Simply put, revegetation is where you protect your investment. Um, it's essential. Most counties force you to revegetate immediately. Um, it's getting to the point now where often you've got to revegetate as you go. Certain portions of the road will require it as you proceed. When you have an area that's revegetated, all this water, all this sward, this grass, whatever it may be, whether it's a meadow grass or love grass or whatever we put back, is going to slow the water down, it's going to absorb water, and that is the basic goal of revegetation is, is to keep the road from being washed away. Those roots get in there, they dig deep, they hold things in place, and this is why you have to revegetate your property. We prefer to use hydro seeding to revegetate our roads. It's a little bit more expensive, but the results are plainly superior to any other other means of revegetation. Hydro seeding is the process whereby with a big giant tanker truck we blow a, an amalgam of tachyfier, kind of a glue-like substance, seed, fertilizer, lime, onto the slopes. And even if it rains that day, that stuff's going to stick on there. It's going to stay on there. It's going to take seed. It is going to germinate and we are going to get coverage in the shortest possible period of time. You can see the mix of grasses coming up here. There's basically three. You only really see two. Um, but what's interesting is that this was only sprayed three and a half weeks ago. And when folks object to hydro seeding or they think, well, we can do this ourselves, I say, can you really do this yourself? Um, the goal, of course, is to stabilize the site permanently and to protect your road investment here. This is the best way we know of. In three and a half weeks, the site is completely stabilized and the grass is up. And obviously our clients have the opportunity to pick what kind of seed they want um, based on the availability of sunlight in that particular area. Um, but in any event, the beauty of hydro seeding is it comes up very, very rapidly. We offer guarantees on our road construction and as soon as we have 75% vegetation, our workmanship guarantee kicks in. In other words, we feel like the weather is out of the question as far as a, a variable and we're responsible for everything after that. So. Um, it's an essential part. It should be complete. You shouldn't end up with bare areas in your grading. Your whole road bed should be, your whole road area, your whole corridor should be revegetated so that it's not only uh, stable but attractive. Okay, our hydro seeding's been done and now it's just up to us to come back and monitor its progress and make sure we get full germination. In effect, the cake's out of the oven, it's on the table and um, we want to make sure that everybody's enjoying it. Review these eight steps. Spend some time going through them. Make sure that your road building contractor has accounted for all eight of these steps and can offer you an explanation with regard to any of these steps. Leave one out, it's going to cost you money later. Here's the basic rule. Do it right the first time. Anytime you have to come back to correct a mistake, any savings you may have procured by hiring a cheaper road contractor is lost. I'm going to say it one more time. Do it right the first time. Account for all eight steps and make sure that your planning and layout phase is done correctly. Anytime you make a mistake, any savings you originally had is gone. Road building standards in the southeast are generally pretty poor, especially for residential roads. Go look at your prospective contractor's previous work. 
go make sure this guy's done a good job. Go talk to his clients and see what kind of what kind of uh, reputation he has. People skip this step and they think their own judgment is enough. And don't just look at a brand new road that he's done. Go look at a road that's two or three years old to see how it's holding up. That's going to be the real test of time. This is a road that's going to be durable. It's going to be here for decades. It's going to require minimal maintenance. And in that sense, it's, it's an excellent value for the homeowner. You can see that our site is stabilized, that we have a road that's usable, that's on grade, and that is well surfaced. This is how a residential driveway, a residential road should look when it's done. Contractors need to do a better job. Consumers need to do a better job of asking for a better job. Once again, I'm Frank Vogler with V&V Land Management. Um, hope you've enjoyed the video. Give us a call. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, let's all help change the face of land management.